Well, ladies and gentlemen, friends, thank you for joining us for this evening's program. I'm going to introduce you to Dr. John Moss, who is an educator at the National Museum, and he will lead you through the rest of the program. Okay, thanks, Liz. Uh, appreciate it. And I want to say thank you to everybody who is on the program tonight uh, to hear about George Mead. And um, so we appreciate your participation. Uh, once again, uh, this is the uh, beginning of our Civil War week where we have a lot of programming. And uh, tonight we're going to be welcoming Dr. John Shelby of Roanoke College. And uh, he is the author of a new book on General Mead, which I have right here. And uh, it's called uh, Mead, The Price of Command, 1863 to 1865. So I would like to introduce uh, John Selby to you. He has been a professor of history at Roanoke College in Salem, Virginia for 35 years, received a PhD in history from Duke University. Uh, some of his prior publications include uh, Civil War Talks, which is uh, he uh, was a co-editor of um, editing uh, interviews with Confederate veterans after the war that came out in 2012, and uh, also Virginians at War in 2002. Uh, he is a native of Michigan, and we would like to, on behalf of the uh, National Museum of the U.S. Army, a very, very warm welcome to Dr. Shelby. Thanks for joining us. Glad to be here. Good. Well, let me uh, <clears throat> let me just start by uh, we'll advance the slide because I want folks to see the the uh, book cover of your uh, uh, of your latest publication, "Me: The Price of Command." It came out last year, I believe, or twenty nineteen. Uh, yeah, actually, the very tail end of twenty eighteen, but yeah, most okay. people saw it by twenty nineteen. Good. Good. Okay. And then we have uh, an image of uh, the man of the hour. Uh, George Gordon Me that we'll we'll start talking about uh, in a few minutes here. Um, what I wanted to start out with in our conversation tonight, um, and before I forget, uh, for those folks uh, who are listening in and watching, uh, if you have any questions, please use the Q and A function at the bottom of your screens, uh, and toward the end of the program, uh, we'll get to as many of those we can. We might consolidate some, but if you do have any questions, please, by all means, uh, use the Q&A function. Uh, so, John, I, I've been reading Civil War for probably 40 years. And uh, I guess in, in, in kind of uh, uh, general language, I, I'd have to say George Meade has not gotten a lot of Civil War love, in my opinion. Um, he really... Uh, it seems like when I was younger, the only biography about him, and correct me if I'm wrong, was was uh, Mead at Get Mead of Gettysburg. I can't right. remember who the author was. It came out in the 50s, maybe, or the 60s. Right. And uh, uh, as, a, as a teenager interested in the Civil War, it was always too expensive used for me to buy it. So what, why is it, you think, that one of the top commanders of the Union Army in the Civil War uh, hasn't really gotten as much scholarly or even popular attention than some of the other ones. And the reason I bring this up is I just got in a new biography on Fitz John Porter. And if Fitz John Porter deserves a, a good biography, it, 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 I'm glad that you came out with yours too. But why is it you think that historians really haven't paid as much attention to me? Um, well, as you know, John, if uh, you've looked at my book, this is a uh, yeah, it was right up uh, my alley is sort of my own little hobby horse that I'm riding in the book. But I, I would say uh, th there's a few um, sensible reasons. Um, and then I, I don't know, then as we as we spin this out, I can get into maybe a little deeper in the weeds about them. Uh, the first is that, um, of course, uh, Meade always lives in the shadow of Grant. Right, as does Sherman, as does Sheridan, but Meade even more so um, because in the last year of the war, when Grant has command of all the armies, you know, and he's beginning that year long uh, continuous assault 
on the Confederate armies. Uh, he is with the Army of the Potomac. He is with Meade. And we'll probably get into more details about how that's been treated. But, but it, ever since, I mean, and actually at that time, uh, it very quickly became easier for reporters, for others to think of that army as Grant's army and forget that, in fact, uh, Meade was the commander of the Army of the Potomac that whole time. He never lost command. He, he was uh, not just a clerk. He was actually the commander. He gave the orders. Um, and again, uh, Meade himself uh, identified this as early as when Grant was appointed in March of 1864 to command all the armies, uh, George Meade writes to his, his wife. And that's one of the great sources for learning about George Meade because uh, hundreds of letters uh, that he wrote to his wife have been preserved. And um, in that, it's an interesting take because he said, um, I don't know Grant well, uh, I've heard of him. I know what he did in the West. Um, I didn't know him in the Mexican War, though they both served in the Mexican War. And he said, but from what I read and what I hear, um, I, I think we're going to be in line strategically and tactically. Um, but he said, once he found out that Grant had decided not to stay in Washington like Halleck did, but to have his office in the field and to put his tent at no more than uh, most time 100 yards from Meade's, uh, as he wrote to his wife, he said, I'm afraid the press and the public will lose sight of me and Grant. And I think that was one of Meade's great prophecies. So that's number, I, I'd say that's right up there uh, um, among the, the top four reasons. Second reason um, is, is, of course, what some of your listeners will be thinking, as I think anyone who knows the Civil War, um, they would remember. Well, Meade won a huge victory at the Battle of Gettysburg. And for that, he, he will always be known. But there, the other victories he's associated with come near the end of the war and uh, Grant is around at that point, right? So he, he doesn't have um, that opportunity to just shine on his own. Not, not that, um, now he did have a time there uh, where I think he would have greatly bolstered his reputation if he had had uh, a huge battle with General Lee in the fall of 1863 and won the battle, even if it had not won the war, right? He would have been adding to his resume then, uh, but he doesn't. Um, and because of that, um, that that's always uh, been a bit of a knock against him. I would say that's the second thing. Um, the third um, is that um, he, he doesn't live very long after the war, right? Um, he only lives until 1872. And most, uh, well, every other top general union that people would know or, or are pretty much a shorthand, I would say Grant, Sherman, and Sheridan, all of them live long enough uh, to write lengthy memoirs and it's not just that they wrote, that they wrote their memoirs at a time when the veterans and others are shaping, I would say, the first histories of the war. And that would have tremendous influence, at least for the next hundred years, right? It's setting down the narrative and the interpretation. Meade isn't there, right? He's not there to give his voice. George Thomas isn't there to give his story, right? Henry Halleck isn't there to give his story. So a, a lot of these uh, people who are around don't get a chance to do that. And, and I think to some people, it seems just like historians arguing about uh, what we call historiography and battles, but it, it, it's really important. And we see this in, in today's world. I know we, we call it like, you know, who gets to set the narrative? Who tells the story of the day? Who sets the agenda? Um, he's not around to set any record straight of his service. Um, and the other thing about Sherman, Sheridan and Grant they had a large and vigorous uh, group of former staffers and others who wrote uh, uh, fulsomely about their leader then and, and for the rest of the years of their life. So, so there's this constant publicity machine for those three men that's ongoing for years that Meade doesn't really have. His, um, he's got a 
a few staffers who write for him. Um, he, he's got a couple others who write positive things about him. A uh, general does like Henry Hunt. Uh, but again, it's, it's just not that constant drumbeat um, of promotion that way. And uh, I would say uh, the fourth uh, reason is uh, because Meade, uh, he doesn't seek publicity. And, and now he's not the only general um, who uh, Grant to a certain degree is uh, given praise for that. He doesn't seem to, to cultivate the press the way others do or cultivate politicians necessarily. Although that's a slippery uh, angle too, because uh, Grant had a couple powerful politicians in his corner, as did Sherman, and that really helped Sherman. And Sheridan was known by everyone as someone um, who always sought to find a friendly reporter to promote um, his story and, and knew how much that would work back in Washington. And the final thing I'll say on this point is, it, part of, of what the title is, and I'll get back to this, I think at other points in our talk tonight, Meade was not blind to these things, right? Uh, Meade knew that he didn't have that many friends in the press. He knew he didn't have that many friends in government. He tried, but, but he wasn't very good at politicking or currying favors of reporters. And he also, also uh, had a, a streak in him that, that he thought um, to a certain degree that a gentleman shouldn't have to do that, right? That the merits alone, right? His performance alone should be enough to sustain his reputation. He says that, but then when he sees criticism uh, or sees the way he's treated by the press or the public and others, um, it hurts him and he complains about that. So I think like many of us, you know, he says one thing on Thursday and another thing on Friday. So he is, he is aware of what's happening. Um, so that's why, uh, long-winded answer, uh, you know, as professors are known to give, but, but I thought I wanted to tackle sort of those four main areas of the Mead legacy, if we want to put it that way. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can you tell us some uh, of Mead's background before the Civil War? Right. And, and this, yeah, I promise this one I'll keep shorter. So, um, his family is from Philadelphia. He has this uh, unusual background for a Civil War general. He's actually born in Spain, uh, but his, uh, he's born there. It's just a circumstance that his father is a naval attache to Spain at the time, um, and, and he doesn't live there long. He's, he's back in America by age three, right? So no real memory of Spain, but if sometimes people see that when they read random biographies of generals and they think, how is that? Right, American general born, you know, in Spain, but but that's it, right? American family happened to be living there. Uh, his his family uh, had been uh, wealthy, I would say, um, uh, around the time his father became a naval attaché to Spain. Um, uh, not one of the ten wealthiest families in Philadelphia, but but definitely Philadelphia upper crust from uh, being merchants. Uh, but his father pretty much lost his whole fortune um, bank, uh, bankrolling the Spanish monarchy as it fought the Napoleonic Wars, and he never got that money back. He never got it from the Spanish government. He didn't get it from the United States of America when it took on claims that Americans had against Spain in a treaty of 1819. And so the, the point of all that is... Um, he would have known about, uh, he would have family members who went to the best schools, visited the finest houses at a time when the name was um, right up there with importance with wealth. He had had a good family name, but it was a family that had fallen uh, somewhat on hard times when his father dies, uh, when uh, George is very young, right? Uh, George is just uh, 13 years old when his father dies. So what his mother does is get him to apply to West Point as soon as he is old enough to apply and he attends West Point. Um, he's not very happy there. He, he attends it as a teenager, right? So it was a, he was very homesick actually. Um, and then he put in his requisite year, 
of military service um, after he graduates in the class of 1835. And then uh, he leaves because um, he wants to seek employment um, as a surveyor, right? And he thought that would be more lucrative. And it worked uh, for about six years, except it was what everybody would understand today. You know, it was the gig economy at the time. It was all contract work. So he would work six months, one place, 10 here, nine there. Uh, during that time, he uh, meets and, and marries a prominent woman in Philadelphia, and he's starting a family. So he needs greater security. Um, and in 1842, he rejoins the army uh, with a, given a position in what was this new branch called the topographical engineers. And what it meant, our equivalent, was that he was primarily a surveyor um, and to a, a lesser extent an engineer. Um, he would then spend his next uh, 19 years at a variety of posts, including serving uh, ably in the Mexican War. Um, and after the war, he decides to stay in the military service. Um, and he's involved in uh, a lot of lighthouse building uh, up and down the East Coast. Some, a couple lighthouses still stand. Um, and very, very similar to someone who was a near contemporary of his, Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee was engaged in that as well during that time frame. And uh, then in 1856, um, he's sent to be the supervisor of a now forgotten, uh, famous uh, government surveying project of the mid 19th century. Uh, the government uh, for almost 20 years, actually more than that, um, had its own crew surveying all the Great Lakes. So he did that for five years. When the war starts, like everyone else, um, he itches to get action and finally gets an appointment as a brigadier general in the reserves, in the Pennsylvania reserves. And from there, um, then he has a continuing uh, series of battles he fights in and he, uh, and what gets the attention of his superiors and others for his uh, cool and capable leadership under fire. Um, and that'll lead up to probably maybe a transition of how you know, one brigadier general moves up the ranks to becoming commander of the Army of the Potomac in two years. But um, it, it's a pretty fast rise, um, but um, it, it's, it's not meteoror uh, meteoric, but um, still, uh, it's a steady rise. But up till then, it really, you could say he was a career army officer. Okay, thank you. Um, so in, in the beginning of the Civil War, um, we often read about factions and uh, some folks were associated with McClellan, who was more of a conservative. Uh, he ran afoul of the various House committees on, on the conduct of the war because he, he wasn't against slavery. He was not a, a pro-abolitionist at all. Uh, did, did Meade, especially in the first couple of years of the war, did, did he affiliate himself with any of the Army of the Potomac's uh, Political factions. Great question, and and be, because it, it it really develops on on two tracks. Uh, one, he prided himself on uh, not uh, trying to get involved with the the Washington politics, right? I mean, he would engage in army politics, right? Um, what general is getting this post or command, and then you talk to another general to do this. But he prided himself on that, um, and and he did um, have that uh, old notion, which I assume maybe some uh, high-ranking officers still carry today, um, that that uh, although they vote, they don't necessarily tell anyone what their party affiliation is or who they voted for. Uh, he was very much of that mindset, right? He he and he, he didn't like to be associated with a faction, though he did hold political beliefs, but that, that's one track. Um, and it's actually a track that, that is part of the reason he gets the, the job of commander of the Army of Potomac. And we'll probably get to that in the subsequent question. Um, the other track is this, and, and it can never be understated. Having said that, um, he rises pretty rapidly um, under McClellan's Army of the Potomac um, and so he, 
his history is completely entwined with the history of the Army Potomac, right? He's pretty much there from the beginning and definitely there at the end of the Army Potomac, right? So every step of the way, he and the Army of Potomac, you know, their histories are, are one. But like uh, almost every officer or uh, you know, top officer of that time, 61, 62, um, who are they raised up by? By George McClellan and the people around him. So he would always, from the time he was appointed to the time uh, the war ended, um, there were Republicans who always felt around him was the whiff of McClellanism, right? So even if he said, I'm not part of the McClellan clique, I never was, I wasn't a close friend of McClellan's, he was not. He was not invited to his, his tent for special meetings or anything. It didn't really even uh, seek that much favor with McClellan, but he was always seen as part of that a group of officers promoted from within by George McClellan. And, and I think, uh, you know, maybe when we get back to the last question, I'll, I'll tie that back into Grant and, and also just Meade's legacy. So you um, start your book uh, or, or your story, the main part of your story in 1863, um, but Meade had been with the army for a couple of years before that, uh, he had a prominent role in the Battle of Fredericksburg um, uh, on the Union left. Right. Uh, so uh, can you tell us uh, how the book is structured so that it starts in 1863? What was your uh, interpretive plan uh, going while you're writing the book to, to kind of really focus on, on 63, 64, and 65? Right. So. Um, I want to refer back to, to where you started this. Um, there, there is that earlier biography of Meade, and there, there have been several written in the last 20 years, not, not that lengthy, a uh, number of articles about Meade. And, and in fact, I would say actually in the last 30 years, um, but primarily um, in uh, somewhat a little bit in scholarly journals, some popular history magazines as well. Uh, people, uh, there's a group of which I'm part of trying to take a fresh look at Meade and looking at his, his performance, his reputation, um, and trying to see him, I think, uh, in a more complex way. So I, I want to say that's out there. But when I looked at, at the literature, uh, when I started on this, uh, I guess approximately about a decade ago, what I really want to focus on was the, of course, the most well-known part of Meade's military career, which would be his years as commander of the Army of Potomac. Um, and I wanted to look at that because uh, I started, I suppose, from a premise of, of what I have long felt after years and years of study of this, that uh, sometimes in Civil War literature, or maybe often, I do believe the, the Army of the Potomac, right, um, gets a bit of a short shrift in this way. Um, I would say the standard interpretation would be it was a big army, it was a good army, but the soldiers fought hard, but they had um, bumbling, incompetent generals, right? And it took the firm hand and the aggressive driving nature of Ulysses S. Grant um, and his sidekick, Philip Sheridan, to sort of take this big machine and, and form it into the battering ram that would knock Lee's Army of Northern Virginia out of the ring. Um, and I just, uh, that's in a, a view and interpretation. I think that's largely been there well over a hundred years, um, still espoused by many. And I just don't accept that. I, I think the, the Army of Potomac was darn good. I think the Army of Potomac, uh, I would always argue to, to me, uh, well, I think it's the most important Union Army of them out there, although it's clearly not as successful as the Army of the Tennessee. But still, um, and part of it is I, I measure it by um, the strength of its foe. And, and there was uh, no 
Confederate Army to match the Army of Northern Virginia under Lee. So I believe the Army of Potomac has been short, given short shrift. And therefore, I, I didn't want to start um, doing a history of the Army of Potomac and then look at its, its series of generals because in fact, it, it is plagued by the problem of uh, rapid turnover at the top. I mean, uh, what I do in this class, I look at, you know, uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, from an organizational fighting prowess side, victories, give a lot of credit to Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. And I would argue uh, from the military side, victories and other ways, of course. One thing to always keep in mind, uh, Lee commanded that army from 1862 to 18, to the end of the war, and he always had the firm support of the president, right? And so um, his subordinates, you know, uh, essentially most of them died off, so he had to bring up new ones, but it was the same head guy backed by the same president that whole time. Um, and, and that just allows for a, a cohesion at the top um, that the Army of Potomac uh, really full, never fully achieved, not like the, the Army of Northern Virginia, but especially not um, in its first two years, right? Because McClellan never got along with Lincoln. Uh, he's in charge, and then he's, he's kind of not in charge, and then he's in charge again, and then he's dismissed. And we go through Burnside's uh, very few months and Hooker's few months. So that's it. It is tough. It's it's during that period of Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville, right? It's it's a very low ebb for the Union effort and the Army of the Potomac. But but look at the turmoil at the top. So what the North, the Union gets, and the Army of the Potomac especially, um, they get steadiness for the last two years of the war, right? One guy at the helm, right? And that's George Meade. Um, now his subordinates, like the cast comes and goes to some of them to a certain degree, and he eventually has to slough off a few. But in terms of need, I, I like to look at this, this part, um, you know, from Gettysburg on to Appomattox, right? Um, the union, it, it, it's slow, it's halting in some points, but it, it's on a steady march towards ultimate victory over the Army of Northern Virginia. And at its helm is George Meade. So that that was the frame, right? What, what did he do? Um, and it's also the most important job he, he would have in his life. His life. Um, and uh, well, I'll, I'll tie this back in when we can wrap up how this, how the, the title, the price of command ties into all this as well. Thanks. So we have Meade appointed uh, at the end of June to be the commander of the Army of the Potomac. Um, seemed to come out of the blue. Uh, then within days fights arguably the most important battle in the, in, in the war. Um, you can argue that certainly. Um, but then Rather than get the praise for that, uh, there's there's kind of this um, period in the days after where Lincoln and Stanton wanted to keep pushing. You, you just defeated Robert E. Lee, and they're on the run. They're on the ropes. Uh, you you can you can pin them to the Potomac, and there's there's basically the narrative for forever has been Meade was too slow and. Uh, uh, should have been able to catch Lee and destroy the army. What's what's your take on the post Gettysburg, maybe 10 days, two weeks? Um, well, let me start at, at the top interpretively, which is that um, I didn't want to add too many reasons when you asked me that, you know, why, why you know, the, is he kind of almost unknown or just considered like, you know, one shot victory guy. Um, and I, I listed my four, you know, I, I argue in the book and have argued elsewhere, those 10 days at Gettysburg um, 
they are almost as crucial to establishing Meade's reputation uh, at the time and ever since as the Battle of Gettysburg, right? And it, it, it is, uh, you know, it's exactly as you pointed out to the listeners, right? That, um, you know, the, the underlying dynamic is that uh, Meade's large army chases Lee's large army, um, does get down there at Williamsport and the two armies face each other, but there's a, a critical day there where uh, once the armies are in position and, and the Union army is there, uh, Meade pulls all of his corps commanders, all of them, and uh, wants, he's not asking for them to decide. He wants to know, uh, you know what, what they would want to do. And so, uh, you know, the but decisions are, are basically three, right? Uh, you know, do we attack? Uh, do we wait for Lee to attack or a version of that? Do, do we just wait a little bit and, and assess him more? And I think it's, it's important to, to note always that not a single one of his core commanders is for attacking. Now, well, people who have studied this a lot, they know this. Uh, you could easily say, well, that's tough. You just, that's what, you know, a really, you know, Napoleonic-like figure would just say, you know, it's my job. You know, you're going to get up tomorrow and attack. Um, but uh, Meade heard all of this, and he, what he basically went down to was the third option. He, he said, uh, tomorrow, I'm going to survey things. And because... Uh, you know, he again, the lines had just Lee had had time to dig some defensive lines. So he does spend a day looking at the lines. And that evening, he tells his men to attack the next day. So I think the general narrative is he lets Lee slip away. That's absolutely true. But a small yet critical detail he was ready to attack, but there was a delay of a day while he assessed the situation. And, you know, again, you know, that's either the sign of a thoughtful, deliberate commander, or you might want to say it, it's a sign of a lack of aggression. Um, when Lee's army then slips away, right? And it, it happens, and I should say, it, you know, I, I think listeners are out there, somebody is, you know, knows the Civil War from A to Z and, and others may know it somewhat. Um, when Lee's army escapes, um, it happens um, with um, a, a tremendous rainstorm and they all go out at night, right? Um, and they go um, across on those um, pontoon boat bridges that they build. So it, it is, it's an amazing uh, feat uh, logistically. Now, there's another point that I think really uh, needs to, to be stressed here. And that is that it's um, at its best, I put it at its best, um, Lincoln and the public, but I think even more than the public, because news would be a little slow back then, Lincoln and some of the people in Washington, they are so thrilled um, once the news from Gettysburg begins filtering down, right? So, I mean, we now know the battle ended on July 3rd and there's, of course there's just dispatches, but the, the news is always a little sketchy and there's conflicting reports. By the 4th, 5th, 6th, it was apparent, right? That the Union, the Army of the Potomac had won the biggest battle of the war against the toughest foe of the war, right? And I think what that did, it, it led everyone um, to expect that the next thing would happen, right? That then the general and the army that can pull that off, surely they can grab um, a defeated army and, and end it, right? And, and that's everyone's dream. I think that's what we sort of forget today. We know the war lasts two more years. Nobody knows that in July of 63. Um, and, and so, of course, you would hope that maybe this battle would be the end battle. Um, where that ties in, and a lot of people 
um, who don't study military history don't know this. Um, I don't fault them for it, they just wouldn't know it. But, but if you study military history or talk to top officers, um, there is this public perception that once an army is defeated in a battle, it is so demoralized that it's really easy to just surround it and make all the, the defeated surrender. And there wasn't a single Civil War general on either side who would have agreed with that proposition. They all knew what we in the public don't, that a defeated army right, can be just as ferocious as a victorious army, right? And it, it, um, it of course, morale is going to be lower. And of course, you got your wounded with you and you're on the move, something like that. But that's where good leadership and training and experience comes in um, because uh, armies almost show their mettle more in retreat and defeat um, than they do sometimes in advance and victory. Though I think for all of us, you know, that's that's the stuff of movies, right? Uh, an advance and then capture the flags like that. And, and the final point to say about this, I, I stress this sometimes in my Civil War class that I teach, the, the public never uh, stopped having this notion to the end of the war, right? Uh, up to the last four months. And, and I think it's a completely understandable human emotion. Of course you would hope that this battle, I mean, if you go back to 1944, who wouldn't have hoped that after the Americans and their allies to successfully land on Normandy and take the beach, well, you know, maybe the Germans will surrender. Well, hey, they didn't, right? Now for another 11 months. Well, in the same token, if you look at the Civil War, right, th there are very few instances where an entire army is captured, right? Uh, two that, that people point to pretty early in the war, um, the Union Army at Harper's Ferry is captured by uh, Stonewall Jackson's army. It's about 13,000 men, right? Huge embarrassment for the Union. And of course, right, the one that, uh, and I think quite rightly, vaults him to the pantheon of generals, uh, at least that Lincoln liked, was Grant's victory at Vicksburg, right? Because there, he surrounds the city and the entire army there surrenders. Uh, the only thing I would might add, Grant did have something helping him there. And that was that the Confederates under Pemberton had their back up against the Mississippi River and the Union Navy prevented them from escaping that way, right? There was no escape route for those guys. But honestly, if you look at the whole war, um, the only time you see large Confederate armies surrendering en masse or being trapped is in the last three months of the war. You don't see it before that. Um, but where this question started, just want to get back there, is expectation was so high that I, I think everyone was set up for disappointment once Lee's army escapes. Because if you're blowing up this balloon of expectation, once you know that Lee's army um, is back on the other side of the river and safe. What everybody knows is, oops, this war is going on and on and on. And I think that um, really hurts uh, Meade's reputation at the time, right? Uh, though, you know, I will say this, no Grant or none of the other generals around him or Sherman or Sheridan or contemporaries or Lee, none of them ever faulted him for that, right? Because they knew how hard it is to, to capture, um, you know, uh, an entire army in retreat. So I think yeah, we'll move uh, on to the next question. Let's, let's, um, let's make sure we, we get the, uh, get to the, the last year of the war. Okay. Um, so, uh, Grant becomes Lieutenant General commanding of all armies and comes to DC in March of 1864 and decides that he is going to move out of Washington. He's not going to have an office uh, in the War Department. Uh, he's not going back out west uh, where he was the most victorious. Um, 
and decides to put his headquarters with Meade. So um, what? Uh, let, let's talk about, for a little while, what was that relationship like and how did that affect the operations of the Army of the Potomac um, and, and Meade's reputation? Um, initially, as you said, I believe, uh, he was glad to have Grant there. And he offered to resign the command of the Army of the Potomac so Grant could get his own guy in there. Uh, so, but John, just take us, take us through kind of that relationship with Grant and Meade and how uh, it was a little bit odd for that to happen. And, and um, right. You know? And, and so um, a couple things about it. it um, and I'm glad, you know, you brought us back to that to just everyone realizes that that grant is is right there and it what what people don't realize uh, again is uh and that's why you got to study it and you got to get in deep into my chapters there to see it um they actually worked pretty well together right and uh, grant w would uh you know he would make ult the ultimate major decision like we're gonna uh, you know take this path to head south and try to get you know ahead of lee's army and stuff like that um and and sometimes uh he couldn't resist himself he he said he was going to stay out of tactical decisions but every now and then in the throes of a battle he got involved uh not too much but the thing was um meade always tried to keep it professional and Grant too, right? And I, I think what gets lost at the time in the history is it's it's easier, uh, you know, here's one sort of formula, right? Um, you know, it, it, to raise Grant up his reputation, it helps to raise up Lee's reputation, right? Because then if Lee is seen as this tremendous general, who was ultimately defeated by Grant, right? They both rise together. But but in any of these sort of what set, you know, Greek tragedy pieces, there has to be someone holding the great general back, right? And who would that be in this case? It would be George Meade, right? Because he doesn't have the sort of killer instinct that a guy like Philip Sheridan does. But, but part of what I argue in the book and try to prove through the historical record more than just my argument it, is that it that really doesn't capture the relationship at all right um, they they consulted each other they talked about things um, and largely Grant left tactical decisions uh, up to Meade something like that and so that is missed and Meade offered his resignation at first I'm glad you mentioned that um, he offered it several times after that, um, and it was never accepted. It was not accepted by Lincoln. It was not accepted by Grant. And um, another critical factor here, and I want to point this out. I want to miss this. In May of 1864, right, this is after the Battle of Wilderness and then after the Battle of Spotsylvania, two huge battles for the Army of the Potomac while Grant is there. Uh, Grant gets a letter from Washington. Um, who would you, there are going to be soon two slots for major general in the army, right? Just two, it's going to be two. What two officers would you recommend to this? And he wrote, and he didn't qualify it at all, Sherman and Meade. He said, they are the fittest officers I know to command large armies. And what I argue in the book and maintain, Grant never backtracked on that. He never took that back. And, and he, he pressed for me to get that promotion, which came later than Sherman's. Um, and and if, if Grant had felt Meade was holding him back, I think he would have got rid of him because he, he did get rid of people he felt held him back, right? Say like a Rosecrans, but he never did, right? So he felt that Meade was a good and useful general. Um, now, having said that, I will say he fights a lot harder for Sherman and Sheridan than he does for Meade, but he was never close to Meade. Uh, that was professional. Uh, the other little 
big point I want to make, but it's a, a point I like to make sometimes just to, to audiences. It, sometimes when you read books about the Overland campaign or meet and grant, um, if you don't come across a writer painting uh, Mead as a someone holding Grant back, right, holding this great general, you know, his instincts in check. The the other interpretation would be, well, you know, he he seems uh, a little fussy, uh, got a bit of a temper, um, slows things down. Not not really a bureaucrat, but but doesn't act with. Um, alacrity, right? Um, uh, doesn't uh, make that, that sort of, of move. Um, and uh, again, um, that's just not borne out um, uh, by the record, right? Um, he is there and sometimes he presents ideas and, and they're not acted on. Um, and uh, they, they move forward uh, together as they work to defeat Lee. All right, are we ready for questions now, John? Yeah, let's go for a few questions here. Um, let's see. Um, this is about this question here is about the uh, the mine run campaign. Um, <clears throat> if you would briefly tell uh, tell our audience about that opportunity in in the fall of 1863, um, did and the question is, did Meade lose uh, at an opportunity at Mine Run for the uh, successful battle before Grant came, or was it, or was it prudent for him to decide at the end not to attack Lee in those positions? Uh, great question, um, and and I would say that there's two quick answers. One, if um, and, and just to tell people, so this was um, one of these moments of civil war. It was a near battle in Mine Run, Virginia, and um, uh, Lee and Meade had been playing cat and mouse all fall. And what each general was trying to do was find, they kept their armies in motion all up through Northern Virginia. Uh, both of them uh, sometimes chasing one, sometimes pursuing uh, one or, or retreating. What, what each of them is trying to do is find an opening, find a moment where one general will leave a flank exposed. And it finally occurred at the end of November 1863 by mine run. And Meade had been getting incredible pressure from Washington to fight a battle, fight a battle before the winter. And he knows this, um, but he is, I would say, I must say, he is a cautious general, and and he doesn't want to attack unless he feels he has a pretty good chance of victory. Um, he doesn't get to make this decision. What happens is um, that uh, his one of his subordinates, uh, uh, General Warren, has been given extra troops to lead the attack. And when Warren wakes up way before dawn and sees the defenses the Confederates have built um, just overnight, um, he then calls off the attack on his own. Meade learns about this. They exchange words. The words were never recorded. Um, and uh, with this occurring, uh, there, there is no battle. So for the listener, yes, I... I think it was the prudent thing not to attack um, Meade. Uh, he talked about it uh, both ways, actually, later. At one point, he said, well, you know, maybe if communication had been different and uh, commander had moved a little faster, we could have attacked. Uh, but then within six weeks, he's saying, no, I think it was the right thing. Um, however, uh, there were those around him, maybe some friends, some in the newspaper business, and others who feel that if he had had an attack, even if they had lost, uh, he would have been at least commended for uh, being aggressive, right? But my counter to that is uh, he had witnessed firsthand what aggression wrought for Burnside at Fredericksburg. And Meade was not about to end up in a Fredericksburg-like situation where Burnside ordered an attack that um, 
most people could see was doomed to failure. So he, he wouldn't have wanted a repeat of that. But, but I do think it, it definitely uh, mm -hmm. affects his popularity in Washington and it affects his legacy. Uh, John, one of, the, one of our audience uh, uh, raises a point that neither Meade nor Grant seem to have had outsized egos. How much did the restrained ego factor account for their continued success, in your opinion? You know, that's a great question. Um, uh, yeah, I really like that one. I've not, I've not had that before, um, <laughs> making me think. And uh, 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 I, I think uh, I want to say thank you to the listener. I'm going to include that in my next meet talk. Um, I hadn't, hadn't thought of it that way, but I, I think they both, you're right, they, they are big enough, right, to be humble and to take a back seat when necessary and uh, to bite their tongue, right, uh, which is rather ironic, I just might say, because someone will probably bring up didn't Meade have a bad temper? Because that's one sort of story about him. And I, as I say, honestly, in the book, yes, he did have a bad temper, right? Um, he never, uh, there's no recorded instance when he blows up as, as superior. So like many people with a sharp temper, there is always an element of control. Um, but uh, there are other people with a quick temper. Uh, Sherman had one and it didn't really seem to hurt his, his reputation. But again, um, you know, if you want to, to, if you need to, uh, you know, if you, if you got to raise up Grant on the backs of somebody, um, well, then meets at an easy target and the temper is one thing to look at. But um, in terms of uh, movement of troops and decisions, he could definitely um, suppress his ego, listen to others, and, and then either go along with what his commander, Grant, would argue or go along with a decision of others if, it, if he thought it was a solid decision. So I, I think that's a great question. And I think that does explain a lot why um, they could work together effectively. John, uh, one of the more tragic episodes of the Overland Campaign in 1864 were the very costly Union attacks uh, at Cold Harbor. And uh, one of our uh, audience members uh, is interested in knowing who had tactical control over the army on the, during those attacks? Was that was that Grant pushing? Was it was was Meade the, in control of the army that day? What's what? What are your conclusions on that? That's another great question, and uh, someone knows their Cold Harbor. Um, actually, um, this is is one of the instances that kind of undercut the argument I'm making, uh, where I would say. Grant, you know, if, if to the popular mind, he's that, you know, that piston that drives the Army of the Potomac to the victory that it couldn't have, even though that enormous cost of life, and, they, and people often talk about Cold Harbor, right, as just an example of this. Uh, actually, that day on the battlefield, uh, the tactical decisions uh, largely rested with Meade. And so um, now he and Grant uh, they agreed on the, the time of the first assault. They agreed that assault should be made. Um, and uh, as the morning wore, wore on, uh, Meade, he's ready to call it off because of, of the reports he's getting from the generals leading the attack. Um, he's ready uh, to call it off by mid-morning. Um, and then at that point, um, uh, Grant, uh, is hearing this and he hears it from Meade and he decides to check it out himself. He rides around a bit um, and then he comes back to Meade and says, I agree. But in, in terms of those first five hours, though Grant and Meade, and that's again, they're a team, they agreed this attack should go forward. Um, Meade was in, in tactical command of that. So um, yeah, if you want to pin uh, the blame for Cold Harbor more on Meade than Grant, that's, that's not an unfair assessment, right? Because he, as I said, Ormar, he is the commander in the field making tactical decisions and, and he um, pursues it at least about mid-morning. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question too about the Spotsylvania uh, uh, 
the uh, Battle of Spotsylvania during the Overland Campaign. Uh, was Grant justified in overruling Meade's doubts and authorizing Sheridan's Yellow Tavern raid? The raid led to Stuart's death and the defeat of the Confederate cavalry, but left the Union Army uh, blind at Spotsylvania. What are your thoughts on that? Excellent question. Um, I, yeah, my thought, probably no surprise, on this one, I, I'm in the Meade camp right? Because they're not going to know, you know, it, sending Sheridan out on that mission, um, they, no one could know that S Stuart would be killed during that mission and that afterwards, no one cavalry commander for the Army of Northern Virginia would sort of have, uh, I guess, uh, Stuart's full capabilities. So, so that's sort of, you know, looking backwards, I sort of making the, the most out of what Sheridan did. Um, that, I uh, want to talk about relationships just briefly, the Sheridan-Meade relationship, uh, that was never good. That, wa that was fraught with discord from the start. Um, and uh, that, I lay a lot at Grant's feet, right? Because Grant had his eye on Sheridan from way back. He thought a lot about Grant. I mean, he thought a lot about Sheridan. Um, he just thought Sheridan was this scrappy fighter and uh, he would let him, you know, whatever, you know, like a dog chewing on a bone, he wouldn't let go. And, and Sheridan always reinforced that notion. And uh, during the, the early part of the Overland campaign, um, Sheridan didn't like where Meade sent his men and didn't like the role that they were playing. And he, Sheridan goes to Grant, you know, and, and sort of says, you know, well, no, he's, he has, sends emissaries to Grant, you know, I, I want to be more solo. He has a huge argument, which others see with Meade. Um, and then Meade goes to Grant and says, Sheridan wants to be independent. What should I do? And Grant said, let him be independent. And, and that at the command level, of course, that, you know, that, that undercuts Meade's legitimacy, right? Practically speaking though, I do want to wrap it. It was probably good, getting back to where you said, <laughs> that Sheridan was off on this mission um, because uh, he was going to probably continually disappoint Meade by the way he carried out the orders. Um, and uh, from Sheridan's point of view, he felt that the cavalry should be this independent operating force. Um, and uh, he didn't want to be under, I would say that, you know, the, the that sort of close command of Meade. So maybe it was better they were separated. Uh, one final, or we'll try to get one or two more in here. Sure. For the of time. Um, which history of the Battle of Gettysburg do you think is fairest in its evaluation of Meade's performance? Um, I, I, um, I, I like, uh, the, the combination. I, I like the, the fans volumes, right? I, I like the detail and the complexity that, that he, uh, brings to this. Um, and I, I like, uh, the Earl Hess volume on Pickett's charge, right? So I would say, those two authors go hand in hand to me. I, I think they're, uh, for, for well-known books, I think they're pretty fair to meet at Gettysburg. Um, and I should say, there have been historians and even some generals and others in the past who I think have been fair to meet at Gettysburg. Uh, but what people might have in their library would be um, the fans' volumes on Gettysburg and probably the Earl Hess on Pickett's Charge. John Selby of Roanoke College, author of a book on me that is very enjoyable. I read it and uh, glad to have it uh, at the, at the uh, National Museum in our collection. Uh, Want to thank you for participating tonight. Uh, it was very good. I can't, I can't believe we're already done. Uh, um, and we thank you for participating. I'd like to thank the audience as well for some great questions and, and for joining us uh, tonight.
we, um, if I could get Elizabeth to put in the chat the um, website address for our Civil War uh, week. We have programming uh, all week through Friday. Uh, tomorrow at noon, we have a um, uh, what we call a battle brief, which is going to concentrate. Uh, it'll be uh, slides and images and maps and concentrate on the Battle of the Wilderness, speaking of Meade and Grant, uh, 1864. And then tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, we have Dr. Elizabeth Varon of the University of Virginia, who will be speaking on U.S. Grant, particularly toward the end of the war, the Appomattox campaign. So um, Elizabeth has put in the, uh, the uh, website for uh, the National Museum of the US Army and you can get to uh, all of our programming under education in that tab. So we hope you'll join us. And um, John, again, appreciate it. Uh, the time, the insights, uh, great, great answers. And, and we probably could have gone another two hours with questions, but uh, uh, we, gotta, we gotta let George Meade go to bed, I suppose. So. Uh, that sounds good. And, and thank you for having me. And uh, also to all the listeners, uh, you know, if they want to reach out, they can find my uh, email address at Roanoke College or uh, whatever. They want to hear more about me or about the Civil War or have some questions, just, just follow up and I'll try to get responses to you. Thank you very much. Okay, everyone. Well, thank you again and uh, a good evening to everyone. And that concludes our program. Good night.